be here. Hi, it is. It okay, is we're October, recording now. It is October 13, 2022. This is the regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee, Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and by Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means, members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance or members of the public are possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I need to go around and see if everybody can hear us. Pat, do you wanna can, can I'm hear present. us? Um, Andy Jo? Present. Jennifer Tao? Present. Cam Rooney, present. I think that's, that's it. And we have Rob Mora and John Thompson joining us. So thank you. Um, there are no public hearings today. Uh, so we go right to the action items and the associate member vacancies on the ZBA. I have not reached out to the folks that are on the list from within the last two years. I will certainly do so by the next meeting, which is the 27th and have some feedback by then. <clears throat> Sorry, this is a scratchy, scratchy throat. <coughs> um, so the next item is 3B, residential rental bylaw. And uh, on the agenda was review of bylaw language in the working draft, focusing on purpose, definitions, and other recent revisions. And I wonder if Athena could put up the first page of um, revision uh, based on 2022. I think 0912 is perhaps the last round. I'm sorry, Pam, I wasn't ready to share the screen tonight. What are you looking for? The general bylaw, the, uh, the residential rental, the draft of 10-4? Uh, section A and B, the purpose, the definitions. Are you asking me to pull up the pages that say purpose and definitions or a different document? No, that, could you pull that page up? That was our homework assignment. Perfect. Good, good. Um, so if you could scroll down to A, which is the purpose. I was, I was reading, <clears throat> I'm really sorry about my voice. I have come down with something. Um, Looking at looking at items number one, two, and three, they're all, or at least one and two are fairly similar. And I had a suggested alternative to the wording for this. And so I would start with number two. If we could add different words in, perhaps in a different color, Athena and I. I'm sorry, I, I, it's going to be really difficult for me to edit this document while I'm taking minutes at the same time. So if, you, if you'd like someone to do that in real time, then um, I can give share screen permissions to everyone else. I can try, Pam. Okay. That'd be great. I'm sorry, I, I don't have enough hands. I've been asking for extra hands, but they... I, I've only been gifted two in this life, so I'm not sure I can do anything about that right now. So what I was suggesting is that number one and number two are actually very similar. And so I was going to propose um, the following wording, and it would be based on item number two to implement a proactive rental inspection program. Oh, excuse me, number one, this is, this is line number one. 
to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its residents through a proactive registration and permitting process. Number three would then become Number, item number three would become then to eliminate housing blight. And then four, four stays as, as is. So I was just trying to consolidate the first two items. Pat, I see your hand up. Muted. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the work, but I think the it's the way it's currently written just is very clear, very simple, and direct. And it's starting to feel. Um, I was very excited to see in number one to protect health, safety, and welfare of residents, and to eliminate housing blight. Everything else is how we're going to do it. Uh, so I, I would like it to stay the way it was. Any other comments? Randy Jones? So I'm still thinking it through, but um, I liked, in some sense, I liked the separation between, even though it kind of repeated itself, the health, safety, and welfare and housing bright blight, <clears throat> but also the the difference between that and the proactiveness of the program, because um, in some sense they're two different things in my thinking. Um, you know, the whole purpose of the first, the one we have now was to protect health, safety, and welfare, but we didn't have that proactiveness that we're trying to go after now. Mm -hmm. And so I liked the fact that those two were separate. Um, and the one thing that was eliminated when you did this wording, Pam, was the proactive inspection program, which is really what we're, the mm -hmm. biggest change that this, this revision yeah. is doing is that inspection program being proactive all over the place, you know, every single rental unit. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I don't like the elimination of that part of what was number two. I actually, I actually had inspection process, but I didn't read it properly. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with taking it back to the way it was, but I just, just seemed like there were some redundancies, but if you're comfortable with that, let's move on. Can we eliminate the red the red typing? Okay, moving to definitions. That was quick lived. Um, I would any any suggestions on definitions. Um, Andy? I just wanted to see whether John or Rob had a better definition for dormitory or whether this one is sufficient for dormitory. At least on this page, I might have questions beyond, but on this page, I knew there was some concern about the original dormitory definition. John, John or Rob? muted. 
John or Rob, any comments on dormitory definition? Rob, what's the uh, building code say about that? Is that where we're going to take our definition from? I, I don't have that in front of me, but you know we can look at the building code definition. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't. I don't have any other idea on that right now. I don't see any other comments. Um, I would actually ask if it makes sense to add one called uh, dormitory-like apartments, and we have several examples of dormitory-like apartments. One is forty-seven uh, Olympia Drive. I. I, uh, the two downtown ones, one East Pleasant and the, and the upcoming 11 East Pleasant are actually dormitory-like apartments, but they are in fact mixed use buildings. So I just wondered though, if we could, if we could add dormitory-like apartment buildings because they are certainly a category. Um, and I think, I think the ones on the new, new units coming in on Lincoln are also apartment-like dormitories. Pat. Thank you. Can you say a little bit more about why specifically they're dorm-like? And I honestly don't, I have an idea, but I'd like to hear what you're thinking. It is a, it is a category in zoning. In no, I know dormitory is a category, but you're talking about dormitory-like. And could you clarify for me what you mean by that? Um, I, I was looking at a, a rental thing that's actually outside of Amherst, but it was being advertised for uh, Amherst. And it seemed like there were apartments, but there were shared facilities. Um, I'm not sure if it was a kitchen or, or what, but there were downstairs rooms that were shared by everybody. Is that what you mean by dormitory? Like that the rooms are not independent other than for sleeping or I'm just, I just need a clarification of what you're thinking. I'm actually gonna look at Rob and uh, especially because I think we do have a separate category for dormitory like um, apartments and they are in fact um, the, the, the restrictions, the setbacks, et cetera, I think are different than dormitory. And as if I am not mistaken, Dormitory tends to be on or owned by the university or a higher ed institution. I may be wrong. Rob? Yeah, so the, for the purposes of our zoning bylaw, we, we have a use classification that includes the dormitory and, and the defining piece there is that it's related in some way to the, the university or one of the colleges. Uh, it, it doesn't really define it. There's a little bit of criteria in that section of the bylaw, but it doesn't define it any further than that. Um, I think what, you know, what you're referring to is um, with those recent buildings is something that was um, presented to the planning board with uh, the first Olympia Drive application uh, calling and, and and uh, bring support for the idea kind of nationwide that there's an apartment style dormitory as a model. And the planning board accepted that and, uh, but it stayed in the same use classification. So it doesn't carry a different definition. It doesn't carry a different uh, meaning or set of um, dimensional standards in the bylaw um, based on how it's laid out or, or constructed. Uh, so I think more traditionally, before these apartment style dormitories, uh, and and more like the fraternities or sororities or other social um, built uh, uh, dormitory type buildings that John would inspect, you know, there are a series of rooms with common hallways, common living rooms, common kitchen areas sometimes, and you know that's very different from these new buildings that are per, they're just apartment buildings. You know, they might have some amenity spaces or common spaces for studying games, exercise and other things, uh, but it's really just an apartment building for the dwelling unit purposes. 
So is there not enough is there not enough differentiation between dormitory, which which I understood was um, either owned by or operated or located on um, a higher ed institution and usually in the ED zone, which we don't actually say here. So that's not the case, you know, that it doesn't have to be on property owned by the university or the college or it doesn't and it doesn't have to be on ED district because we permit it in the RF district as well. So there's there are you know some other possibilities there, and it's not restrictive in the bylaw one way or the other. Okay, so so um, from your perspective, does it make any any sense to differentiate this, or shall I just drop it? Uh, right now, I'm not seeing you know a need to to have you know a different uh, meaning for that. I mean for the. What we're talking about is whether or not it's subject to the permit and the inspection program, and in both cases they would be. So I'm not sure there's a meaning, a reason yet to separate them. <laughs> okay, that's that's what I wanted to make sure is that we that we didn't somehow lose the ability to to inspect. Okay. Does anyone else have any um, suggestions on on um, additional definitions? I have a question. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, so I just want, so on Amity and Lincoln, there's a, is that like a frat? There's a residence that has like 17 students. What does that qualify as? I believe it's owned by Eagle Crest or managed by Eagle Crest. What's the address right on the corner of yes, Amity and yeah, Lincoln? Lincoln and Amity. Yeah, big it's, white. A, it's a multifamily. So those are separate units. I think there's maybe four. And, and five. they have their own kitchen facilities? Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. So they're covered. We've got that covered. Okay. <laughs> Anything else on, on definitions? Um I'm going to I'm going to turn to Mandy Joe. So you have uh, recent changes that were added into this text, which are I believe in blue. And are they? Oh, sorry, Pat. Why don't you go ahead? You're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry about the muting thing. Um, I've missed some meetings, so I apologize if I'm wasting our time. But I'm. Why do we have that the um, authorized person has to live within 20 miles of the Amherst town line and then uh, and not be a current tenant of the odor well except as provided so that seems fine but what's the 20 mile what if it's 25 miles I mean I don't understand what that's for Andy so I was going to ask the same thing but more of is that the right limit um, there's something similar, I think, in some other bylaws. I'm not sure it's in our current one, but I think the goal is to have someone that is accessible that, accessible in an emergency contact situation. And so the question is, how close does that person need to be? And so I my one of <clears throat> one of my questions was going to be, is 20 air miles an appropriate distance? John, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I'm not sure where the 20 miles came from. Rob probably knows. We probably did um, cut and paste that from someone else's bylaw originally, but um, there's a little bit of um, leeway with this 20 miles. Yes, we, we often ask Google how far it is from here to there. And um, this year, especially, um, one of the admins has been pestering me with, um, well, it's 21 miles, John, you know, what do you think about that? Yep, 21 miles is okay. It's, you know, they live in Greenfield, that's that's good. Um, we, it was really aimed at folks that are really in the Eastern part of the state, they're in a different state, they're out of the country. We need, we need a way in an emergency to have somebody pretty local that, that could respond. Doctor? 
yeah, again, I mean, that's someone who can respond. They don't have to live here. You can own a property and live anywhere as long as you have somebody nearby that is either managing or it could be called in an emergency. Well, this would be the person in charge, not necessarily yeah. the owner. The owner. Does anyone feel uncomfortable saying 20 to 25 miles or approximately 25 miles within Amherst? So I, I wonder if instead of air miles, we go with counties. Would it be appropriate to say Hampshire, Hamden, Franklin County or something like that? Um, you know, John just said Greenfield's 21. Well, Greenfield seems local enough to me, you know, like, um, would a county designation, whether we include Berk Berkshire or Worcester is a different discussion, but would a county definition make more sense? Pat? That just feels more flexible than uh, 20 miles. And um, so I like the idea of a county. Thank you for thinking of that. Will that put any undue strain on, on access to these people? I'm asking John and Rob. No, I mean, I don't think so. I actually don't think there's a problem with the way it's done now. Can we just add the word approximately? When I think of, when I think of Hamden County, you know, that's some of that's quite a ways away. Definitely, definitely more than 20 miles. I guess my concern with tw approximately or even just sticking to 20 is 21, then it's technically a violation. Right. Our town might not cite it, but it's technically a violation, right? Um, approximately, well, is 30 approximately 20? Is 25 approximately 20, um, if you use the word approximately? Short answer is probably yes. <laughs> Everybody feel comfortable with leaving it for the time being at Hamden, Hampshire, or Franklin County? Okay, good. Okay, let's move on. We have re resident, the resident manager, which I think we talked about last time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Do we have any restriction on where the, the resident, oh, that's the resident manager. What about the, what about the property manager or the person in charge? Okay. Any concerns about number, number 12? I see no hands, so let's let's move on. So we we have um, now we're in a totally different category, but but it's still recent additions. If we want to delve into item six, C one or C one, excuse me. <clears throat> can uh, can someone explain the additions of the blue text? Um, <clears throat> looks it looks to me like it's the timing of the of the advertisement and whether you have a permit in hand before you go out to to advertise is that right yeah there was some concern that if you don't have the permit you can't even advertise for renting um given the wording up above in the first sentence of one um or the first half of the sentence it's a really long sentence um so that addition has been added to say that, you know, if you've put the application in, you can advertise even if the permit hasn't been granted or issued yet. Rob? Yeah, 
So and then I'm looking at the the last sentence of the blue uh, language, and you know, in that case, the rental permit number wouldn't be available yet. Yeah. So we just gotta make that connect that and make that work together somehow. So Mandy Joe, I think you added that wording. Do you want to strike it? Or Jennifer? I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, now, is our tenants allowed to move in before the permits in hand? No. I have. I thought we talked about the fact that they they would not be necessarily in hand, uh, especially if it's a rotating inspection. That may not. That may not hold any water so I guess what I'm thinking is I mean this may be too nitpicky if it's a renewal and it just hasn't totally come through well, I don't know I guess you know um so there has to be some evidence that they've applied you know because we say you need a, a permit to have tenants living there I can see advertising, you know, if it's, you know, July and you're not having tenants move in until, you know, the first week in September. So I don't know, has this been a problem in the past? Well, the wording, the wording here says it shall be unlawful for the owner to operate rent or offer to rent until uh, until the applicable residential rental permit has been issued. So that's saying you got to have it in hand before you even advertise to rent. Is this possible? So now we're saying you can advertise, but they shouldn't move in until. Because presumably if they don't get, if they've applied, And I understand maybe it's different for renewal, but if you're starting for the first time, I mean, you don't want to take the chance that there's a tenant living in a building that, you know, isn't up to code because they haven't, you know. And then if they moved in and it's not, you don't want to have to evict people. I don't, so I don't know if that situation could happen. Andy? Um, so a couple of things, we'll see it later on, but, um... The permit is the way this bylaw is worded is um, disconnected in some sense, the timing of the permit from the inspection. Um, the application will just have to detail that they've had an inspection within the certain amount of time that they fall under. Um, so it's not in, in many towns, it's apply for a permit, get inspected, get issued a permit. That's not how this bylaw is written because everything would have to be inspected in a one month period, basically. And that's just unreasonable. Um, so, and then the other thing is somewhere below is a conditional permit. Um, I forget where it is. It must not be in this one. It's it's probably an E um, where if the inspection has not passed and they're working on it, a conditional permit can be issued while things are being corrected. So I think that addresses some of Jennifer's concerns. Um, so I'm wondering if we maybe look at that first part of number one and just eliminate offer to rent in that section and 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 leave it as you know uh, you know operator rent must have the permit and then maybe that doesn't need that new language to clarify that. Just a thought.
that seems to. So the, the any advertisement shall include the rental permit number assigned by the town or if the application is pending. That seems like a, a funny sentence. Could it just say unless the application is pending? I don't know. I guess if you eliminate the offer to rent, you don't even have to have an application yeah. before you've offered to rent. So the sentence makes no sense then. I mean, it would be hard to enforce because you could actually offer to rent without that even application there. So let's let's um, think about this for the next meeting and come back to this item. So we're looking at the next the next change and if we want to go through item by item here. Um, so uh, any thoughts on on E1? This this states that we would be looking at it on a parcel of land basis, so parcel by parcel. I think we ought to discuss if we want to if we want to deal with permitting on a parcel by parcel basis, a building by building basis, or a unit by unit basis. And um, I'm looking at the enforcers, John and, and Rob, to just discuss the pros and cons of that. And in given the through the lens of sort of an equitable fee structure, where where the single family owners are saying, um, or the owner occupieds are saying, we're paying more fee than you know than Chirwadi does on his property. That's not fair. So, can we talk about this? Rob. So I think you know last time when we when we discussed this, I'm pretty sure I recommended that we keep it you know per parcel of land rather than getting into the either buildings or number of units, uh, mainly to keep you know manageable numbers for us on permitting issuance and and just uh, maybe a little simpler to have uh, information on the property uh, and and that might have been the main reason for it. I, I still don't think that whether we permit by parcel or building or, or unit has to define how we set a fee schedule, uh, which can on its own be by unit or number of buildings. So I don't think they have to be together. You know, we don't have to think of them working together in that way. Um, I think we're really used to the parcel of land uh and that would be a significant change for everybody a lot of um and john would know more about our system as far as the time it would take for an applicant to enter you know 30 units permits for 30 units into the system rather than one um just my experience with it it seems like it'd be a lot more work for everybody and and not much gain for doing that Okay, uh, Mandy. You know, I, I think I, I lean towards what Rob said, but I, I do think it, it relates to what fee structure we potentially decide on and how we um, word that fee structure. So it might be better to come back to this one after we've talked about the fee structure options and how that might work to then fit parcel per versus building versus unit on. I agree. I agree. But I did want to talk about the dorm exemption here, which goes back to what Pam was saying earlier. Um, there's a note still here about PPPs, um, right? Where do they fall under this exemption? Right now, it's written as they have to be owned and operated by the educational institution and located in the ED district, which I read means Olympia Place would not be exempt. But um, what about what's going up on Lincoln Avenue? Would that be exempt or not? 
because I don't remember who's going to actually own it. And would we want those exempt? I guess that's what we have to talk about is which ones are exempt and which ones aren't. And then word this properly. Jennifer. Um, the ones going up, well, you know what? <coughs> know this. The, the, I know, I don't know if it's both. This, there's a graduate student dorm with like 201 and an undergraduate with 823. The undergraduate is a public private was partnership and it's actually being managed by a, a, another entity, not UMass. So it's a bit of a hybrid. It's a dorm on it's on UMass owned property. Rob might, but it's um, I mean there's literally like a, a professional management company, I think they're Canadian that they manage college dorms, these public private entities. <clears throat> Rob. Yeah, I, I think you have that right. I've looked at the agreements with the developer. The, the buildings are owned by the university. They're not owned privately, but they're managed and operated by the private uh, entity. Uh, so, you know, and I looked at that for the purposes of determining whether or not we needed to permit the construction of the buildings in the building department. And it was the fact that it wasn't owned privately that made that decision uh, for us to allow that to, to stay with the state building inspector's office. So, but does that, that mean, oh, sorry, Pam, go. No, go ahead, go ahead, Mindy. I was just gonna say, by this wording, then they would need to obtain a permit, a rental permit. I, I think they'd be exempt. Because Is it they're, operated they're, by they're, the educational? They're not operated by the educational institution. They would so, not they, so they wouldn't be exempt then. Correct. Um, correct. Is yeah. that something you want, Rob? Not really. Not for that that particular building. I'm trying to think of other examples just to make sure I'm not missing something. But uh, we actually won't be doing any inspections of that building. Annual our periodic inspections will be done by the state inspector's office. If there's a housing complaint, it would be responded to by the uh, the Department of Health and Human Services at the state level. It wouldn't be our health department. So um, if, if it only turns out to be that situation, that type of arrangement, uh, we, we would probably not bond it anyway. Jennifer. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't imagine that the uh, managers of that building are expecting to get rental permits. <laughs> that I would think it functions as a dorm in that respect. Can we come back to the conversation about dormitory like apartment buildings? Um, so far, we have not exempted them from rental, and that would be Olympia Drive, that would be One East Pleasant, that would be um, 11 East Pleasant. So I would definitely like to keep those on the hook for, for our program. So they are still required Olympia Drive and all, but I, I, I guess I must just say that I, uh, I disagree with referring to 11 East Pleasant and one triangle or whatever it's called um, as dormitory-like buildings. Not everyone who lives there is a student. So I think that just perpetuates a misclassification and a misinformation about those buildings. And we need to be careful because they are definitely managed much differently than an Olympia place that was built and permitted under the dormitory use in the RF district. And so that, that's just something I have to say. They would still get inspected though. Anybody else on this particular item? Could could Mandy, could you actually type in the on a parcel of land that's blocked out in green? It's pretty hard to read. It, could those letters be black? Thank you.
Um, I'm looking at number three, and and I'm I'm just not sure I'm ready to talk about um, permit denials because I just want to I want to make sure that we are able to link um, if we decide to go with a point system that we're able to link points to um, problem properties. Um, I know we have a we have a nuisance house bylaw, but we don't actually say how many actions creates the nuisance house. It just talks about, you know, if there's a party, if there's underage drinking, but it doesn't say once and done, you're now a nuisance house. Um, it, it's, I think we need to be clear on, you know, essentially how many transgressions are allowed before they become a, a nuisance property, a problem property. My guess is that has to wait for a legal opinion and also a review of the regulations to fit them in. Yeah. Um, on item number six, and I'm not sure how, Mandy, I'm looking at you. Um, getting through all of these, I'm not sure where uh, you would have planned to stop and change gears to talking about fee structure. Keep going a little bit. We could probably keep going a little bit. I don't know how much more blue there is. So well, there's a fair amount um, in H. So we'll come back to G, the fees structure, fees and fee structure. hard to read. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't personally didn't have any specific uh, changes on these. If anyone else does, raise a hand quickly. It feels like we need it feels like we need a whole session to just talk about inspections, inspection regularity, inspection cycle. I think that would be very helpful and it may not happen today. Rob and Joe. There is a typo there very minor, uh, by the Commonwealth or federal government, instead of of federal government, fourth line, yeah. And when we get back to the, in, talking specifically about inspections, it would be very good to refresh um, our tables on um, that whole list of exemptions that are already um, inspected on a regular basis. It would be really, I think it would be very helpful to document um, what those undergo already, just so we can, we can be really clear about what we're changing or what's not required. So could we potentially bring I don't know whether this is Dell time, Steve from the um, audience in, he had sent an email that I forwarded to the rest of you and, and is in the packet now um, regarding the energy efficiency stuff. I don't know whether we need to change the wording in the bylaw or not, um, but now that I see it here, it just reminded me that he was here to answer any questions we might've had about what ECAC is recommending we add. And I apologize, John and Rob, I forgot to forward it to you, the email. Um, but it is in the packet, so it can be pulled up from there. Um, I'm fine with bringing Steve in if, if 
Um, we also have an opportunity to bring Renata in as we're talking about these items rather than waiting through the whole thing to, to get to the very end where we go to, to address some of her concerns. So let's um, let's bring Steve in then. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hi there. What can you um, tell us? What can you tell us about energy efficiency standards? Okay. Let me. I, I guess since not everyone has seen the memo that I sent to Mandy Joe just last night, I'll briefly summarize it and spell out the uh, recommendations from ECAC. Um, previously, we had been working on a concept where rental properties might have to get rated with a building energy rating system. And this is a system that would rate the amount of insulation in the walls and the types of windows and would kind of be like a miles per gallon rating of a car, but it would be an energy rating for a building. And there are several of these, but what we learned over the summer from speaking to some people that do these sorts of rating systems, they're primarily done during the building design process for new buildings. And then that gives them a chance to get a rating and then tweak the design before the building is built. They can be applied after to an existing building, but it's somewhat logistically complicated and there's a lot of estimation involved. So. Considering that, we've, we've moved away from that recommendation and moved more towards, a, I guess, a data gathering approach where a couple of uh, suggestions to include as part of the registration bylaw. The first would be, since it looks like the town inspectors will be doing fairly comprehensive inspections, we suggest that they do a couple of additional, add a couple of additional items to their checklist. Um, one would be to confirm the information that is provided on the rental permit application. Uh, and that would be information like the building age and the approximate square footage of conditioned space, the type and um, ages and efficiency of the heating appliances, both space heating and hot water heating, uh, and make sure the fuels used, whether it's natural gas or electricity and or fuel oil, those things are recorded properly. And then the inspectors would do a, I hope, a, I think, a quick qualitative grading of two key factors there. One would be the amount of insulation in the building, and it could be largely a presence or absence. Um, and the second would be a qualitative assessment of air leakage. Um, I think we may want to have more conversations with, with the town staff, building inspectors, to see how that sort of a assessment could work. Um, hopefully they have some experience and could do that. It could simply be an ABC where you're know, good, fair, or needs improvement type of scoring. So that would be sort of the first component, having inspectors both confirm information and add a little bit of new that would help us identify those buildings that really would benefit most from uh, energy improvements. The second two are uh, new. They weren't in our previous recommendations, um, but we've talked about them and we like these concepts. The first is that uh, apartment complexes that are five units or more become required to report their actual energy use um, using the EPA energy efficiency, uh, sorry, the EPA portfolio manager platform. And this is a free platform. It's quite commonly used by uh, building managers. Many states and cities require buildings to report this way. And there's a way that the results can be electronically transferred to the town of Amherst staff. That would only be for the larger buildings where the data can be aggregated. So that avoids problems with um, sort of privacy issues about uh, exposing a single tenant's energy use patterns. Uh, and then the third and last would be a requirement that all rental properties get a mass save audit uh, within three years or some grace period uh, following the adoption of the new bylaw. And the rationale for that is the mass save audits, as you probably know, those are the door to all kinds of uh, in, uh, incentives and rebates and, and interest-free loans 
it's pretty much the starting point if you're going to do an energy retrofit. Get one of these free mass audits. They have them for single family homes, for smaller rental units, and even for larger ones. So they are customized by the type of rental unit. So those three things would combined, I think, raise awareness, help the town and the ECAC understand which buildings might need further sort of um, targeted incentives or help to, to bring up their energy standards. And it would help get their energy efficiency on the, on the radar of the building managers and the owners so that they could begin to plan to improve their conditions. So no, no required rating system, no longer, we're no longer recommending a particular level of energy efficiency and required improvements to bring it up to a threshold. Um, rather, it's more gathering information and going, providing some incentives to building owners to make energy efficiency improvements and take advantage of the incentives that already exist. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions or, or thoughts or comments. Thanks. Any questions? I haven't gone back and compared what we've put in the application, sort of part of the bylaw and maybe even our regulations that are not haven't haven't been discussed yet. But are there specific things you would want included in the application that ECAC would want in to be asked on an application? And if so, could we get that full list? I think you mentioned a bunch in your email. Um, is what was in the email sort of everything you'd be looking for? Or are there others to make sure we've included everything you're looking for? I, I can get you that list. Uh, we, I think we provided it before. And then the language that you or was in the draft previously left it up to the discretion of the code officer rather than encoding every particular item into the bylaw. And we are, we are fine with that approach. Um, because it could be that after a year or two, we decide that there, we don't need to ask this anymore, but we might need to ask something else. Um, so leaving it up to the discretion of the code enforcement officer, I think, is, is fine. And I will dig up that list that we provided before and can send it to you. And can you kindly include Rob and John, please? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, feedback from Ron or, I mean, Rob or John. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I, I had uh, seen this earlier in the packet and um, I, I thought it looked good. But, you know, my only uh, reaction to some of it would be that um, we want to make sure that this, so this will be part of the regular inspection of all the other things that an inspector would be looking at. So, you know, we, we don't want to, um, you know, make that too big of a task. Uh, at, at every inspection and keeping it to visual assessments, uh, not needing any uh, special equipment or, um, uh, you know, gadgets to set up and, uh, and just thinking efficiency with the numbers that we're going to be dealing with. Um, and, you know, probably not likely that we'll be able to, you know, bring ladders and climb up into attics to measure insulation. So, I think some of the information is easily gathered, more like a checkoff type of fuel, whether or not insulation exists. Some of it might be asking the applicant, uh, you know, the owner, what they know about the property. But I think really kind of leaning, you know, going in the direction which we have, we often do now is, you know, really pushing that mass save audit. Uh, you know, I mean, I had a conversation with a, a landlord or a property manager yesterday that may, uh, pretty large uh, company in town uh, and, you know, came to the same conclusion I did. There's no reason not to do that. Uh, so, you know, that's good to hear that from a property manager. And I think if we can continue to spread that message, uh, you know, we'll be able to gather that information through those reports or um, the information that's created by the firm that's conducting the mass save audit uh, to get a lot of this information more accurately. So that's all I had. Thank you. 
I'm going to bring in Renata Shepard if she is ready to talk. Um, this is kind of a short notice, but um, we've talked about just um, some of the inspection items. So we're, we're going through, um, we're now in the section of re essentially requirements to obtain a permit. And Renata, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share? Um, first, first, Mandy Job. Is, is this under public comment? Uh, it can be public comment. Because um, if it's not, we've got other potential problems with just bringing in one member of the public. So Steve Roof is the liaison to, East, to CRC from ECAC. So that's why he can be brought into a committee meeting. Um, but um, if it's not under public comment, there's some other issues with anyone else who might be in the public just bringing people in. Um, so personally, I would have it we're just moving to public comment midway through type thing. I'm, I'm suggesting then we move to public comment for a brief period and open it up to anyone who wants to speak generally about this or generally about anything. And then um, we may have another public comment session at the end of this discussion. Renata, are you interested in sharing any thoughts? If not, we'll just keep going. Sorry, I, I couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> Hello? Yes, hi, you're oh, on. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, Renata Shepard, Amherst resident, uh, small landlord. Um, I don't have anything like new to add. I've sent all, all um, comments, suggestions, concerns. And again, I re reiterate that, you know, please make sure that uh, the situation is fair across the board and not uh, benefiting only LLC companies that can, you know, have access to a lot more resources than somebody that sells their, you know, buys a house and keeps their condo and wants to rent it out that it, it doesn't put them into like undo or, or a, you know complicated situation to uh, to be able to uh, make a little bit of money every month mm -hmm. thank you thank you steve if i may i'll add a personal comment not at all associated with ecac um, but a personal comment i too am a small landlord i have a one unit Two family unit. And as far as the fee structure that you talked about a little earlier, it's slightly annoying to sort of have to pay the same fee for a two family unit that big companies pay for a hundred um, family unit on a single parcel. So I think there's a perception of fairness if the fee is somehow graduated based or scaled based on the number of units on a parcel. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments while we're having a public comment session? Seeing none, let's move back to the uh, Renata's hand went up again. I'm not sure if you want to call on her again. Sure. Renata, did you have another comment you wanted to make? Oh, yes. Just a reminder that of my um, suggestion regarding um, setting the fee as a percentage of the lease um, for everybody. So if a lease is $2,000, if you pay 5% of that is an amount, if you if you charge um, $1,000, you know, it's less. So based on, on per lease or per unit, a percentage of the rent, that would also, also motivate um, landlords to charge maybe lower leases. They, they, won't, they won't feel like they're losing money because of this fee. Therefore, you won't have to raise rents to cover, you know, fees that we find unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Yeah, I just um, wanted to ask that if, if we went an approach like that, that we would have to ask people what they're charging. Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> That's just... You know, because I, I thought that was a creative suggestion, but that made me wonder whether then, you know, we're asking people what their what the rents are, and they may not want to disclose that. Rob. 
I think we can ask the 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 only issue I see with the issue I see with that type of fee schedule is that it's completely self-reporting. Um, we would have no way, you know, it'd be a lot of work to try to confirm that they're proper, uh, that they've inputted the right amount. Um, and, you know, it all, it all becomes public. So, you know, people, other people might be looking at it, questioning rents. It just seems to create a lot more, you know, discussion and issues that don't exist by not having it that way. Um, I, I, I think it's an interesting approach, but uh, I see it could have some flaws, you know, in, in operation. Thank you. So we can put it on the table. We can talk about the pros and cons and maybe exactly how do we approach it and, and is it workable? Um, do you want to go back to the changes in the text? It's 530. So we have... Um, not a whole lot beyond that, but let's go, let's keep going. Well, let's actually, let's, let's table it for that for now. And we'll just pause where we are, which is roughly on page nine of, um, I have revision seven printed out, so I know that's not the latest. Um, but I think it'd be really helpful to talk about the fee structure and Mandy Jo proposed um, in a text format, a number of um, fee options. If we could switch to that. So Mandy, Joe, thank you very much for putting out a straw, a straw proposal. Very good, gives us something to chew, chew on. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple of questions that I was unsure of. Um, so in, in your option A, I'm sorry. <coughs> in your option A, it is predicated on the permit, including all of the uh, inspection fees, both for the initial inspection and for renewals, as I as I understood it from your text. Um, so for single family or owner occupied duplex, it would be a permit fee of $150. And my question is, is that per unit in the duplex or is that, as we spoke earlier, per parcel? Um, so the intent is a duplex, as long as it's owner occupied, would pay $150. A duplex that is not owner occupied would pay $150 plus $15 per unit. The thinking on this one was a single family dwelling unit and an owner occupied duplex, both of them only rent one dwelling unit. Um, and so, in theory, should have the same fee. Um, but a duplex that is not owner occupied rents two dwelling units and therefore should have potentially, if we're looking for fairness, a slightly higher fee. Um, so yeah, for those owner occupied, it would be whatever number we picked. And, and as I said in this, I just put numbers down. I didn't do calculations as to whether it would be self-sustaining or anything like that. It's more of a, let's start the conversation and then we can get information from Rob and John about what we would need to do in terms of the numbers to, to to get the right amount of money to hire the right number of inspectors, basically. So that that also then plays into, I think, uh, your your recommendation or your proposal for uh, townhouses and apartments. Those are the two to twenty five units, and again, it was one hundred and fifty dollars. I assume as sort of a base cost um, for the complex or for the, I mean. An, an apartment building can go up to 24 units. So the, I'm guessing that you're you're proposing $150 per building. Um, so an apartment building can go up to 24 units, but there can be multiple buildings on a parcel. Um, and so it is not per 150 per building. Um, all of the other ones are based on the 
right now how many units in the regulations we are having inspectors inspect. Um, and so the regulations as currently drafted are if you've got under 25 units, every unit is inspected. If you've got over 25 units, 25% of the units are inspected um, or a minimum of 25 units are inspected. So if you've got 30 units, 25 of them are inspected, even if there's, you know, that's well more than 25%. And at a hundred units, 25% are inspected. And so the splits here are based on um, basically the cost for inspect, essentially the inspection cost, that initial inspection cost, because our inspectors would have to go in in a 28 unit building and inspect the exact same number of units that they'd inspect in a 99 unit parcel um, or, or you know, that parcel that has 99 units, even if it's three buildings. Um, and so they would pay in some sense the same amount because it would be based on, in some sense, time at the time at the parcel to complete those inspections was was the thinking around those splits. So it wasn't on a per building basis per se. It was on a how many units are getting inspected basis. Okay. So that's good to clarify that you're talking roughly 25%. Which is why number three is just a flat fee because everyone in that category basically has the same number of units inspected on that 26 to 99. So that's the permit. It also covers inspections per year, presumably. Jennifer. I'm sorry, I see it down below. I, I was just gonna ask about, you know, like the situation I think on your street, Pam, where the owner owns some different properties right near each other, but they're technically different parcels. Not technically, they are different parcels. But yeah, yeah. So that would be. Well, it's like one parcel with three units on it, but it's immediately adjacent to the the homeowner. So that's getting to um, where you have B A one. No, they would fall under two because they're not owner occupied, and they're not a duplex. No, it says. Oh, option B. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I think we also need to discuss um, owner adjacency because I know there are a number of folks in town that that literally own the house next to them, and <clears throat> it's pretty comparable to being owner occupied because you are right there, right there. Um, but we would have to set up some sort of definition of how far is adjacent. Okay, so in your option B, that does the permit B does not include inspection fees, so they are separate. And you're suggesting that a single family or owner occupied up to six dwelling units would have a, a base fee of $100. And I think that is, again, per, per parcel because it is um, essentially one building with six units in it. Yeah, I mean, the difference between the two is what I set forth in the comments. In the first one, the, the costs um, are saved only in um, the only in the number of units there are, um, because you're paying that every year, whether or not you're getting inspected every year, um, you're paying that, that rate, um, even if your inspection lasts five years or three years, right? If you're, even if you're not on the one. And so option B, the savings results in both the number of units that are getting inspected and how often the inspection is happening. Um, so if you're on a five-year inspection cycle, four of those years, you might only be $150, and the fifth year, you might be $150 plus the $150 plus the inspection fee. Um, so those are the, in, in my mind, the big differences between options A and B is, um, do you want a fee structure that say, you know, that, that 
graduates solely on number of units or also on how often you are inspected too. And, and the comments, I can expand some of these comments that show some of those differences. Yeah, why don't you do that? I tried to pull those into a table as well, just to see if I understood what you were suggesting. So I think I can only do one at a time. So option A is everything is included in the in the permit. The inspection is included in the permit. B. Yeah. So for example, option A, a triplex would pay 195 a year every year, whether they get inspected every year or every three years or every five years. Option B, um, you know, I, I did it with an, a non-owner, an owner-occupied duplex, but option B, that triplex would pay 305 in whatever year, 315 in whatever year they were inspected, but only 150 in the years they were not inspected. So if they're on a yearly inspection schedule, that triplex, they would be 315 a year. But if they're only inspected every three years, they would be 315 one year and 150 the other two years for a total over those three years of 615, um, slightly more than the, the whatever I had, 195 a year on, the, on option A, mm -hmm. which would be over the course of three years, 100, uh, 585. I think it, it will help to see this in a table, which which we can well, share. Well, so it, it it's harder because because option B depends. The costs depend truly on how often the inspection happens, on how much a a owner would be would cost over three or five years. Um, so it's hard to put it in a table. It can be done, but it would be a complicated table guessing on, are you gonna be on a one-year plan? Are you gonna be on a three-year inspection cycle? Are you gonna be on a five-year inspection cycle? Well, it, seems like, it seems like it would be on a as inspected schedule. So if you are in fact only doing it every, um, every three years, your option B single family or owner occupied would be a hundred dollar permit every year and then the year that you get an inspection, you would pay $150 plus $15 per unit, if I understand your, your in, math. In addition to the $100 permit fee. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And so trying to compare what someone would pay under option B versus A gets tough because we don't know how often their inspection would be. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Yeah, I just want to make sure i'm following this correctly so um how frequently you're inspected has to do not necessarily with if you, how often you're changing leases but if you have had you know problem free inspections then you having them less often so we're rewarding so nobody's being penalized if their tenants change every year but we're rewarding those who have problem-free inspections in the previous two years. Okay, we'll make sure, thanks. I would be curious to hear what Rob has to, has if he has thoughts on structuring the fees. Thanks. Um, my my thought when I saw this is that you know it's probably not going to fund the program uh, the a fee you know one or the other fee structure uh, and it might be a combination of both uh, you know the the graduating permit fee annually and then a fee per inspection on top of that might be what it takes to actually uh, make the program work uh, I, I don't know how many times I tried the option A to come up with a a scenario that made sense. It's just that there's so few 
uh, properties with, you know, in, in two, three and four. Uh, and there's, I don't know, there's now 800 single families, I believe in the program of the 1160 that are permitted. So um, it, we, we gotta, we gotta put the, we gotta put the, uh, you know, work out the formula and see what the total uh, revenue would be for the program. Thank you. Um, I had some thoughts about uh, another option for permitting or for the, the permits and the fees. Um, and it was predicated similarly to um, Mandy Joe's option A, it would be a permit that included all the inspection fees. And it would be so that in a sense simplifies it. But again, it, like Rob said, you'd, it would have to be commensurate with um, a lot of other factors. Um, so it started with owner occupancy duplex or owner occupancy adjacent up to six units included in the permit and it would be say a hundred hundred dollars a unit the inspection cycle would be one to five years depending on the points accrued any follow-up inspections would be fifty dollars a visit for owner occupancy then you get into the non-owner occupancy and again i'll share this this table, um, I did not get it to Athena in time, but non-owner occupancy would be, uh, you know, one to four, like a multifamily, multi-unit house could be $250 a unit. Um, that would be the permit, that would be the inspection fee all wrapped up. And any follow-up inspections might be a little steeper since it's non-owner occupied at say $75 a visit. Um, then I took the categories that are in the zoning bylaw, section three point, whatever, two five, two six. And I looked at townhouses, apartments, mixed use buildings, apartment like dorms, which is when I thought about adding it to the description. Um, and that those would be a modest, uh, modest fee per unit, but it would be the equivalent of, um, hundred dollars a unit or fifty dollars a unit for an apartment and that we would inspect 25 percent on a rotating basis so I can share this with people um, again it would be interesting if we're trying to classify it by building type um, rather than specifically number of units and I don't I would appreciate some some feedback on on that approach Pat. Yeah, I'm thinking about what you said, Rob, um, and I'm wondering if, and you might not have it, and that would be fine, whether you have a sense of what it costs to run the program, um, how much income is needed to make this work, basically, irrespective of these fees right now, just kind of knowing it's a sense well, I, well, what I can tell you is that the, the program currently has one staff position. That's John's John's position, and uh, you know we share an administrative assistant with other functions in the department uh, to get the work done that needs to be done, uh, which has become much uh, more efficient with uh, a new permitting program for us uh, just in the past year. Uh, so it's made a made a really big difference. Uh, but looking forward is going to be really what, what we have to uh, focus on. So what the, what the bylaw will require for inspections will help me uh, uh, recommend how many staff would it take to, uh, to implement that program. I mean, generally, you know, an, an ins uh, entry level inspector uh, you know, is going to cost be a cost to the town seventy five to eighty thousand dollars for you know the, the the salary and benefit package uh, for an entry level position. So we really got to um, you know uh, narrow down what what the scope of the 
the program would be and then, then have to figure out how much staff is it gonna to take to run it. Thank you. And, and does that include, um, so John, if you're, if you're inspecting, uh, you know, whatever, a single family home, are you spending, what kind of time does it take to do uh, a basic, generally kind of okay uh, dwelling unit with a few issues? And then there's always the follow-up, of course. Yeah, I was thinking of that when you were talking about $50 to go in and inspect something. I mean, you're going to be in there for an hour. $50 isn't going to, isn't even going to cover the costs. And then there's going to, there's going to be a follow-up because you're going to, you know, make a page of notes in that time. So we're shooting, we're shooting too low, it sounds like. Pam, could you repeat what you just said? I didn't un understand it, I'm sorry. I, I said, so it sounds like we're shooting a little too low in some of the fees that we're proposing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Want to move on? Any any other conversations? Oh, the other the other um, um, option that I added to this table was Renata Shepherd's, and she talked about the the five say you know pick pick a number, but say five percent of of uh, a month's rent. So if it's if they're charging a thousand dollars a month, you get a fifty dollar annual fee, two thousand dollars a month, and that would be per dwelling unit, not per bedroom. Um, it would be a hundred dollar annual fee. $3,000 a month would be 150, et cetera. So that was yet another approach that um, based on, you know, based on rent being charged. Mandy. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear where the committee is sort of landing on all these options. And I haven't added Renata's into this one um, as, as her proposal, but um, because I think we need to land on sort of what we prefer before we can start thinking about costs, as Rob said, because once we know what we prefer, then we can start getting the data for X, Y, and Z. Um, and so in some sense, I like the simplicity of option B. You know, it's easy to calculate no matter what, and it, differentiates the costs for a, an owner based on both the size that they're renting and also how often they're inspected. At the same time, I worry that that option um, may bring unpredictable um, revenues in order to hire a predictable number of people because it's based on how often something is inspected, right? Not just the fee. And so maybe, you know, so, so that's where then I look at, Rob said, maybe a combination of A and B where there's a permit fee that's that's based on a, un, a unit thing, but also an inspection fee that doesn't necessarily include the initial or renewal inspection, that inspection that's required every three years or whatever. But I'd like to hear what other people think. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, and I'm uh, interested in um, what Rob and John think more than I, I'd like. So I've been leaning towards the original option A, but I really would like to hear from them because they have a sense of the money in a way that we don't. Jennifer, Jennifer and then Rob. Yeah, I'm always echoing Pat a lot. I sorry, <laughs> but um, no, I I was leaning. I like that. I, I guess you can't see my cursor. A made sense the structure, although maybe we would have to change the dollar amounts. That single family, you know, so that residential permit fee. So I guess that taking you know also into account uh, Rob and John's input on what it costs, which I have, I I can't offer any input there. But but that that structure of A seems fair to me and reasonable, and that, that's A, the top A. And, 
and I, you know, I thought both A and B were um, uh, simple enough for us to manage. Uh, you know, there were, I didn't, I didn't think either one of them were complicated in any way. And uh, I know our, our permitting program can handle both of those uh, scheduled designs. Uh, and I guess I'll stick with what I said earlier. I think that, you know, at, at this point, from what I can see, I feel like it's going to be both. Uh, you know, I think we're going to establish a permit fee under under a, a, like a, a the concept A that uh, tries to establish a, 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 what appears to be a fairer um, permit fee based on size of property, and then. Uh, I don't, I don't know any reason why an inspection per dwelling unit would cost different from one building to another. So, you know, that flat rate for an inspection would apply equally to any property for any unit that's being inspected. And, and that would be maybe a place that I would want to start looking at. What is that, you know, what does that translate to for a potential revenue for the program? And, you know, agree with Mandy that, you know, for us to, uh, you know, pitch this to the town manager, we have to have a pretty solid, predictable revenue stream uh, that I think that'll be really important. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe this is a pipe dream, but I have this idea that vision, whatever that as we're um, the town is renegotiating its strategic partnership agreement with UMass that maybe they would fund a building inspector or two. No. Like it. Yeah, I don't know how that would work. I guess we have to have something until that happens. I'd like to build on what Rob just said. So um, having a having a consistent inspection fee, I think is um, per Per dwelling unit inspected. I think I was trying to, I was trying to be easier on larger complexes because, um, you know, there are so many units and therefore it'd be very expensive. But I think, I think having an inspection cost, whether it's a single family home or three units in a in a townhouse, I I'm understanding now that the work is similar per dwelling unit inspected. And I like I like the simplicity of that and the consistency. Any other thoughts? Mandy, did that give you kind of the sense that you're it sounds like we're we're not there yet, but it, if it's a combination of of two factors, we come back to this another time and we, again, spend some time literally on inspection. And then you know, I, I think it makes it easier to run numbers based on A1 and potentially some of your A2, Pam, um, mm -hmm. where I could potentially run with permits if permits are per building instead of per parcel, um, you know, because then the apartments would be we would know they would all be up to 24 units, right? Um, if it's a per building thing, um, whereas mixed use would be over them. So I think it's hard to say I'm gonna, we can run numbers on 20 different options, right? And that's why I wanted to hear, we can get numbers on some of these then and, and try and figure out what might make sense and where things would be. Yeah. They also don't seem onerous even for the large buildings. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a big enterprise. I mean, those are big yeah. enterprises. If you're going to, even the $25, $15 per unit seems fair. They're not overly burdensome. But again, we may really want to look at that fee and figure out if it's, right. if it's cost it effective. Needs to be, right, right. I mean, it's, it's, it has some room to, if it has to be yep. increased. Um, if we could segue just for a second, um, Mandy included in the packet on this particular topic, uh, the unit counts and numbers of properties that uh, that Rob provided um, looks like 
provided all of us back in January of 22, and that was unit counts, number of properties, and number of units by essentially by category. And I guess that number still holds. We have a total of roughly 4,379 4, dwelling units um, from the rental permit process. And I don't know if that's complete. Rob. Yeah, that, that is outdated information. Um, I, I don't know how much you want to know about numbers of, of units right now, but you know, as far as this schedule, you know, this information goes, we're we're currently in the system, we have 1,166 permits. Uh, and that will uh, cover 4,972 units. Uh, and I and I know Pam, you in particular asked for some information about assessors data. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, with the idea that you know maybe maybe we're not capturing all the all the properties that should be in the program. And I have information about that, but I don't know if this is the right time to get into it. And but so I'll let you guide that. Could you could you? So Pardon me, but could we go back to you said 1166 permits now in the in the system, and that covers how many um, properties? You gave a number. It's like 11. That well, that's that's 1166 properties. Okay, that's how many permits. And I think we have. it was 4,972 units. That's right. Thank you. And if uh, for whatever reason, if it's of interest, we also collect bedroom count now in our latest renewal. And of those units, 10,273 bedrooms were reported in the application process. Great. Rob, it would be very helpful if we could get the new numbers, because I know this is the last the prior permit year and you've got a new permit year so that we can start running numbers on those options again. Yes, and Mandy, I have the breakdown in a similar way. So I can I can give it to you the same way and unless you need, you know, unless we end up changing the the breakdown of the unit types. Rob, since we're since we're on the topic, I would I would appreciate delving a little bit more. It says data on types of units in Amherst, both rental and owner occupied. Um, some of the categories are uh, two apartments, 801 estimated um, dwelling units. What do you mean by two apartments? Somebody owns two apartment buildings. The next category is three or four apartments. Is this by owner? I don't understand the. I think these are dwelling units. So a two dwelling units would be a duplex and three or four dwelling units. So we have one detached, that would be a single family home. One attached sounds like it would be an accessory dwelling unit plus a single family home. Is that right? I forget where I pulled this data. This might be from DHCD, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what what this is exactly. Um, <laughs> you gave it the, to us. Sorry. The the assessors, you know, the assessors, and when you're looking at property cards, they have a numbered, you know, different ways of classifying the the properties differently from zoning, differently from what we're looking at, and um, you know, depending on over the years, you know, they were called different things. You know, you could find an apartment building in one property card. And the same type of building is called, you know, multi dwellings on another property card. Uh, there's two family duplex. There's just a lot of different combinations. What what I did want to tell you is that um, we have we have a new assessor uh, who is extremely helpful and interested in uh, improving the data we have, and we're working with them to to do that. Uh, so we've pulled, you know, we've pulled numbers like this out of the assessor's records with the help of IT to get every 
every property that looks like it may possibly be subject to the program yep. as a place to start. And then we started, you know, eliminating them or getting them through the program. Uh, and that's that's a, a, an effort we're, we're now, I don't know, six or eight weeks into. Um, but just to give you an idea of what it translates to numbers is that there were about 550 properties that we flagged. And it, it could have been for a number of different reasons, I guess. You know, one criteria we looked at is that they permitted in a prior year, but didn't permit with us now. Yeah. So we wanted to get all those just to look at those and check on them. Um, we looked at properties that have a different mailing address for the owner than the actual site address. Uh, and then we looked at anything that was more than was two or more units that had any indication of not being owner occupied by the notes that the assessors put on the, on the cards. And again, they're not entirely reliable, but it's a, it's an indicator. So we've now, since we've taken that, that 550 and we've narrowed it down to about 370 properties, uh, 60 or 70 of them have been permitted. Uh, which might be why you see that number at 1166 differently than the 1070 from last year. Uh, probably is you know where that's coming from. And we've uh, we've done first round mailings to all of these properties to the owners to tell them depending on which category they fall into, we either think you're subject to the program or could you kindly call us and tell us about your property so we can talk about this. And that's what's happening right now. And you can imagine every possible scenario of, you know, multi-generational living and brothers and families and kids and back from school and all kinds of things, in-laws. Uh, and we're working through all that in the way that we did back in 2013 when we started this program. Uh, it was uh, much more labor involved at that time. Uh, with the help of IT, we've been able to move into getting, you know, getting some counts pretty quickly here. Uh, so we're hoping that we're going to, you know, we're going to work through those 370 properties. Uh, seems like every day, some come off the list and some get permitted. You know, that's what's happening right now in the office. So we're going to continue to work on that and, and hope that we'll be able to report that we're really confident in the number of permits, uh, you know, as being accurate here. And then what we always did and will continue to do is monitor the transfers. Uh, you know, uh, John, John will look at the transfers monthly. We have Steve McCarthy in the office looking at them now as well. And, you know, whether it's a letter, phone call or whatever's appropriate uh, to follow up when we see something change owners and not appear to be owner occupied. Uh, so that's just a little bit about what we're working on and uh, the information that we started gathering prompted by your question, Pam, I don't know, a couple of months ago, at least now. Well, I would express my gratitude to you and the staff that have spent time on this because it's a, <laughs> I, I worked with space data at the university and it's like, you really have to, you just have to get into the weeds to figure out if it's something qualifies or doesn't qualify, or I just really appreciate the effort in, in sorting through this, because I think it will give us an ongoing, looking forward, it will give us just a really good basis for trying to implement a, a strong program. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was involved. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks and for the update. Making, you know, sure people have permits, because that's important. Yeah, exactly. As we as we heard from the uh, from the forum, there were concerns about quality of life and and you know safety in some of the apartments or some of the units, and we're we're on it, which is great. Which is great. Um, seems like we kind of covered covered this base. Um, let's see. Any other discussion items that we want to cover today, or at least put on the agenda for another time? Besides, besides coming back to actual fee structure again and inspection schedule, um, I don't see any hands. Um, 
I think I will offer a very quick um, public comment. Renata, if you have any additional thoughts that were generated by this conversation, be happy to hear it. Raise your hand if you if you feel like adding any two cents. Can't tell. It doesn't look like her hand is up. So let's keep let's keep going. Um, minutes. We have a minor um, modification of the minutes from September 29. I think there was a time change from 4:30 to 4:35 at the, at the start of the uh, public hearing. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to accept those? I would move, I don't have them right in front of me to keep the date, but I would move to accept the motions, accept the minutes. Let me, let me pull them up. As amended? Yes. Any second? Second, DeAngelis. Great, take a vote. Um, Pat. Aye. Mandy Jo. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Pam, aye. From the meeting minutes, September 29, uh, approved as amended, and we'll get those back in the packet when they're done. Mandy, your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the announcements. When I made this agenda, I thought we would be putting the public hearings on the food and drink establishments on the 27th of October. We will not. They will be at our November 3rd meeting. Um, because I found out that the planning board is not opening their hearing until November 2nd. So we will open ours the day after they do theirs. Um, so I just wanted to, the, the next agenda, well, I'm not sure what agendas have been posted, but um, the October 27th agenda will obviously be fixed. Um, but I just wanted to make that announcement so that people knew that that date is wrong for food and drink establishments. It will be November 3rd at 4.30 for the food and drink establishment hearings for CRC. Great, thank you. Um, and the other announcement that Mandy put in the, in the meeting uh, agenda is the October 24, which is a Monday evening. Again, it's, it's a follow-up uh, rental permitting uh, forum. Um, to hear back from folks on more of this basic text that we've been hashing through, uh, not just specific topics, but really sort of the gist of, of the text that we're discussing now. Um, Mandy, can you remind me or remind listeners when the uh, renters' rights forum is going to be held? Yes, there is a Know Your Rights forum being or webinar being sponsored by the SGA at UMass, um, the Student Legal Services Office at UMass, the off-campus um, Student Life Office, and I am also attending it. Um, it is on October 20th at 6 p.m. Um, I will be working tomorrow to get some of those announcements onto the town community calendar and forwarding the flyer that I just got today um, to counselors to do it, but it is it is geared towards informing tenants about um, state laws, state regulations, and also the rental permitting, our current rental permitting laws and regulations, um, not what we've been working on. So it's not for feedback on that. It's to let people know what they should be receiving, what they can, you know, who they report to, who they can make complaints to and all of that. Um, um, so it's the 20th at 6 p.m. And can you remind people where that's going to be held? It's on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. And so the flyer will have a QR code to register for it. Um, Great. Thank you. I think John and Rob might have some questions about it. Since John has a question. Yeah, I, um, I missed some of the planning there were some planning meetings about that and then it seemed like there were a lot of planning meetings and, and I, I got overwhelmed and didn't get to any of them 
Am I playing a role there that you know of? Um, I have asked Paul to ask you guys, you and Rob, if you guys could attend if you wanted to. Okay. Um, I am planning on doing the presentation on the rental registration bylaw, but I know SGA and off-campus student life and the SLSO would love to have you there to answer any questions. There is intended to be at least a 20 minute question and answer session. Okay. Um, but, but I had gone through Paul, he was supposed to ask you guys <laughs> if you could show, and I don't know whether he got that back to you or not. I'll put it in my calendar and wait for his request. There you go. And I will ping him again. <laughs> We we did get we we did get uh, asked if we want. I think we got asked if we wanted to attend, but we're, and we're happy to attend. Uh, my what uh, I was going to mention is that if if I could get um, the notices for both the twentieth and the twenty fourth, we're happy to distribute it to our email contacts through the program six or seven hundred uh, contacts. I think last time we sent it out really last minute. And, and we got some responses to that. So if we could get it out sooner, if we, if we have the information, that would be, um, we can get it out relatively quickly once we have it. On my list to tent, send you emails tomorrow for those requests, Thank Rob. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. That's terrific. <clears throat> Anything added to the next agenda preview, which I guess our next agenda is actually the 24th. I did not print out the 27th, but I think it's just uh, looks pretty straightforward. It's a virtual meeting with community forum on residential rental bylaw. And um, it'll be a continuation of people providing feedback on a series of topics. And we haven't, I'm not sure if we've talked about what topics and what order, but um, the, the previous one was structured pretty nicely to sort of check through the list of, um, of considerations that we're talking about in bylaw. John, do you want to add something to that or you just have your hand up? Thanks. Mandy. Did you want me to say something about that? Do you have any, do you, have oh. you already drafted a, a list of topics that is going to be presented at the 24th? I have not, okay. um, but when I do next week um, or maybe this weekend, cause I have to prep for the working session at the council, they'll probably be similarly structured. Um, I'll try to send it out to you guys um, definitely before the community forum, um, hopefully before the Monday working session for you for any feedback on if I missed anything. The both have already the report that has a comparison table in it. Um, so this the report I wrote regarding the work for the working session and the community forum is already in both packets. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at that because I'll probably go through that, find where the biggest changes are and pick the topics based on the biggest changes and the biggest ads or subtractions and all. Thank you. And thank you for all your background work, even though you were even planning to be here tonight. And also, I want to thank you, Pam, for doing a really nice job chairing the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hope you both feel better. <laughs> I'm hacking. Um, so let's see. Uh, items not anticipated by the chair within 48 hours. Nothing. Um, I was going to ask Athena or Athena and Mandy uh, with the table that I did try to craft together. Um, I would like to send it out, but I didn't know if that needed to be. Um, can I send it directly to all members of the committee or must it be in a packet? Um, Athena, you can post it and once you do, I'll put it on SharePoint. Okay. She, she's nodding, I'm sure. She'll send me an email once she's posted it, and then I'll put it in the SharePoint packet for this meeting. I'm, I'm doing it, it right now. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. So I think we are ready to adjourn. I will adjourn the meeting at 621 p.m. Thank you for everybody's time.
And thank you, Robin John. Thanks. Yeah, thank you too very much. Yeah. And thank you, Athena. Bye. Bye-bye. See you next meeting. Bye-bye.